Um, thanks, Andrew, for um, the invitation. And also, I just want to say the morning session was really um, incredible. And I saw the work of people that I'd, that I'd never heard of. And I hope I'm going to introduce myself to you guys as well. So um, our lab is the Spatial Information Design Lab. And it is a think and action tank, specializing, as Andrew said, in the visual display of spatial information. And we've seen a lot of maps today. And I hope that after my presentation, everybody will learn that there's no such thing as a neutral map. Um, there's no such thing as neutral data. Um, all data is collected by, a spe for, by specific people for specific reasons. And there's a lot of data in the world out there um, which should and can be repurposed, which is what we try to do. So I'm going to show two projects today. And you'll notice um, that the first project, which is about incarceration in the United States, is going to be using one data set um, over and over again to, to tell a story. It's designed um, as a communication presentation, so as a slideshow. You should be able to follow it uh, quite easily. The second uh, project that I'm going to show has a connection with a lot of the presentations this morning, a lot of the, um, the fellows' presentations as well, which is about um, migration and climate change, or and put, to put it another way, that human identity is based on movement rather than stasis. And I'm going to underscore the uh, economic, political, and environmental causes of migration. And you'll notice I'm going to be using hundreds of data sets. Um, and the project um, was designed as a 360 degree immersive environment. So my presentation of it will be nothing like um, seeing the real thing, which is going to be um, on display in Copenhagen during the COP15 um, conference. So I hope some of you will, will get to see it. I imagine some of this audience will be there. OK, so I'm going to start with this project, Architecture and Justice, um, which was a competition that we, uh, that we won along with my collaborators at the Justice Mapping Center at the um, Architectural League in New York. Um, we have our next presenter's project here in the, in the foreground. This, it made it um, into a show called Design and the Elastic Mind at MoMA. Um, and it also has been implemented on the streets of New Orleans. And unfortunately, I can't stay at the rest of the conference because that's where I'm headed um, tomorrow to present this work. So um, architecture and justice. Um, a city is, simply a collection, is not simply a collection of people and buildings, but rather a network of relationships. Information about the elements of these networks is constantly exchanged and produced between them. This is the premise of our lab. There is no neutral data. Data is design. Design affects policy. Policy affects the built environment and people. And you can enter this feedback at any point um, along the way. But more importantly for this presentation, the word infrastructure. Infrastructure, the basic facilities, services, and installations needed for the functioning of a community or a society, such as transportation, communication systems, water, power lines, public institutions, including schools, post offices, and prisons. Now, the definition of the word infrastructure in many uh, countries in the world does not include the word prisons. Prisons are part of our infrastructure, but because they are not in the city, we forget about them. Prisons and the people they house are part of our urban communities. Um, prison population in the United States rose from 200,000 in 1970 to upwards of 2 million in the year 2000, and it's still rising. Um, this over here at the top is a graph of um, crime rate from 1931 to 2005. At the bottom is incarceration rate. So you notice that while crime is going up and down, um, incarceration steadily climbs, despite the fact that crime has gone down, um, all kinds of uh, statistics that you'll hear about, incarceration steadily moves up. So um, to shift gears, all of us and our surroundings have knowingly and unknowingly been translated into data. Um, data as individuals. The, the maps that um, I'm going to show you are all generated from this very difficult to um, obtain information, which was obtained by my collaborator, uh, Eric Kadora and his Justice Mapping Center. 
And this is um, information that's collected as people are incarcerated. And the purpose of the data is to track these people through the court system. What we do, rather than look at their crime, is to um, use what they say their home address is before they were uh, incarcerated. So the data in a geographic context, if you don't know what GIS is, every time you have a, an address, you can put it on a map. So we take the home addresses of where people say they're incarcerated as they're being, uh, as they're being, being incarcerated and place it on a map. Um, and when you combine it, uh, join that to census um, tracts, you, you start to understand the concentrations of where people would be living were they not in prison. So the data in geographic context shows people in prison are highly concentrated in specific neighborhoods. Um, this is a prison admission density map, while crime is much more dispersed across the city. And this is a crime map. When you go back and forth, you notice prison admissions are much more concentrated than the dispersion of crime. Crime geographies lead to crime prevention tactics, while prison geographies can lead to community investment strategies. Prison geographies intersect very strongly with geographies of poverty and race. This is the percentage of people of color in Brooklyn. This is the percentage of people who live in poverty. And this is the percent adults admitted to prison. Added up block by block, it cost $359 million to imprison people from Brooklyn that year. And when you add the cost of, um, of how much it costs to house people in prison. This is a map which is expressed in millions of dollars. So what's bright red on the map is over um, a million dollars and up to keep people from that census block in prison. So from a demographic point of view, spending facilitates a mass migration of people to prison, 95% of whom eventually return home. This is a map which connects a line of people um, who have been incarcerated in Brooklyn, to where they are housed um, in prison, upstate New York. Again, here's the expenditure map. Um, so if you look at Community District 16, for instance, in Brooklyn, it has 3.5% of Brooklyn's population, but 8.5% of its prison admissions. Here's Community District 16. When you zoom in, these are the people this is how much it costs to incarcerate each one of them. These are their buildings. So in those 11 blocks that we've just looked at, it cost $11 million to incarcerate people from these 11 blocks in 2003. We've given this the name million dollar blocks. On a financial scale, prison is becoming the predominant governing institution in the neighborhood, but the money goes elsewhere and the prisoners come home. Up to 40% of those who eventually come home are returned to prison. So the, the, the project is a rhetorical one in, in this sense with the maps. You know, what if more money was spent on these places in the city rather than on displacement? Would the city look different? And this, this is our team. Eric Cadora is the um, a prison activist who um, has this center called the Justice Mapping Center, me as an architect, David Reinford as a graphic designer, and Sarah Williams as an urban planner. We um, have tried um, to, to host a scenario planning workshop where we combined all the agencies together to, to try and come out with some solutions. I'm not going to go into that there. We've done this work across the country, are currently working on um, a justice atlas with up-to-date information, up information of 2008 incarceration in 25 states, um, th those who will uh, give the information to the Justice Mapping Center. Um, and we have done a lot of work in New Orleans and proposed a, what we call a justice reinvestment corridor in a very disinvested um, part of the city, have constructed a network um, of not-for-profits and community groups to um, come up with their own solutions to wh what should happen in one of these neighborhoods. Okay, since I only have nine minutes left, I'm going to make a very quick jump um, to a very different project, as I said. So, this is a, a project that was initiated by the Cartier Foundation uh, in Paris. It was a show um, uh, around two uh, quite famous people, Raymond Depardon, a photographer, and Paul Virilio, the philosopher. 
Um, so we were, we were commissioned um, by Virilio. Um, this is a collaboration with the architects Stiller and Scafidio, um, statistician and artist Mark Hansen, uh, media artist Ben Rubin, myself um, as, as an architect and cartographer, um, with a very large team who uh, will be credited later as well. Um, in particular, the people who did a lot of um, the, the visualization, um, uh, Bobby Priotresco, Stuart Smith, and Aaron Myers. So um, this is the one part of the exhibition I'm not going to talk about. Um, this is what it looked like in the room, a 360-degree um, panoramic uh, animation of these, of these maps. So there were six um, scenarios which were um, we really expanded upon Virilia's concepts, um, population shift, cities, remittances, sending money home, political refugees and forced migration, natural disasters or environmental refugees, rising seas, sinking cities, and on its way to Copenhagen, we're doing a scene called Speechless about endangered language and deforestation. So we use global um, data in order to illustrate that people are migrating at unprecedented rates for economic, political, and environmental reasons. So this is um, population shift where every pixel on the screen represented a million people. Um, and as they flocked to make a map, we, we keep seeing the night lights of the city. But this, um, this is a map which shows um, where people, are, wh where the most dense parts of the Earth are. Um, it's based on a, on, a, on a data set produced by Season at Columbia, which counts on a 100-meter grid how many people are living on that particular pixel. And we've visualized that. So this is how it worked in the room. We, we, um, we have this globe set in motion, which actually prints data um, onto, the, onto the wall. And as you can see, the pixels flock uh, to create this map, which shows, which it shows that kind of cliched fact by now that over 50% of the world are living uh, in cities. OK. I'm actually, and, the, and, and um, this, the data set actually projects forward, and so it's showing the 50 fa fastest growing cities in the world. I'm not going to show all the animations, but there are these counters actually showing uh, each, um, the, the way the, the uh, scenario was gridded, counting the population growth as it's, as it's uh, taking place in the world. The next scene um, was remittances. Um, remittances are um, um, a test to the fact that there's an informal global economy that people uh, migrate and send money home in the form of remittances. So this was a data set on 2007, which showed 150 million migrants sent money to their home country. The average was around 200 US dollars. And the cumulative um, uh, cost, the, the cumulative amount of all these little increments of money added up to 300 billion US dollars, which is three times the amount of global of foreign aid sent to these same developing countries. So what the globe did over here was um, print out a map. Of course, the United States is the, the top uh, country to which people are moving to. So you can see on the flags below, it tells you how many people left to come to the United States. And then uh, the US is also the top remitter um, in the world. And it shows how many millions of dollars were sent back to those same countries. And these are the top five, actually. So France, United States, Germany, Canada, UK.
Um, then the, the, the room transformed into a rotunda, and what happened was the money kind of dropped. You, you saw where the money was, the, the top 12 remitting countries and the top 60 developing countries that received money in the form of remittances. Again, I'm going to speed by. The next thing we did was um, forced migration and political refugees using a database from UNHCR, which records every time, um, which records refugees as soon as fi there are 5,000 of them. So um, probably what you don't all know is that it's only since 1994 that internally displaced people have also started being counted. And so there is this correlation. The red in, on the maps are internally displaced people moving around inside of a country, whereas the refugees cross borders. Um, so the whole database was 1991 to 2007. Stop so that okay. The the next um, scenario was about environmental refugees, um, and again, people have been talking about it this morning that um, the floods, um, droughts, and earthquakes are some of the things that cause people to migrate. So, and there is a, a prevalence of natural disasters, which again is is increasing. Um, it's increased something like. Um, uh, 8% or something, it's, it gets higher and higher. Um, and so what we were doing, we were mapping the prevalence of the disaster and the affected population, right? It doesn't matter if there's a flood where there, where there are no people. Um, so what we found was that, what there, was a, that there was a really inequitable uh, distribution um, between the, what happened with the disaster and who the people and how people were affected between the global north and the and the global and the global south, so this is the line that it's no longer first world, second world, third world, but global north, global south. This is a flood database, which shows that even though there might be floods of the first, it shows how floods are getting more and more. Second, it showed that if there's a flood of the same size in the global north and the global south what happens is many people, many more people are displaced in the, in the global south than in the, in the north. Okay. And I want to speed through this. Uh, I assume a lot of you know about carbon um, emissions. These are the cities within 100 miles of the coastal zone that are going to uh, sink. Uh, except <laughs> some of them are going to be lucky to survive because they have better infrastructure. Um, but what I want to quickly do is um, talk about the speechless and de 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 deforestation scene because it makes so much of a link to um, the person who was talking about Indonesia um, just in the last session. So what we've done is visualize um, tropical, tropical forests um, these are the fires in Brazil, which, I, I'm sorry, I don't have animations um, to show this, but we're going to be showing Brazil, uh, Cameroon, and Indonesia to show that Brazil um, is responsible for 47% of tropical deforestation, Cameroon 5%, and Indonesia 13%. These are the fires um, in Indonesia. And then what we're also trying to show is the confluence between endangered language, indigenous population, and forest loss. And we've picked a part of Brazil, a part of Cameroon, and a part of uh, Indonesia to show this. So in Cameroon, what's happening is there are a lot of logging roads that have been built. So although there is not as much deforestation, there is potential for deforestation. This is a composite of the before and after um, of Indonesia. And then endangered language, there are actually 96% of languages um, in the world are spoken by 3% of the people. And by 2030, um, probably all those 
90% are going to have disappeared and only the 10 most dominant languages or so are going to still be spoken. So thank you. <laughs> thank you.